Hello there, Evie here. So getting straight down to the question, is an old CPU any slower than a new CPU? Now I don't mean generational differences, I don't mean a 6700K versus an 8700K or anything like that. I mean literal age. Is one that has been used for five years any slower in any measurable way, mean, well I can't measure every single way, but in a general measurable way compared to one that has not been used at all and has just been brand new sitting inside its packet for over five years. Well, we'll test that today. So I have here a brand new i7 6700K and in my test bench now is the i7 6700K that this channel has always had for all of its testing with micro ATX cases and CPU coolers. So if you want to know why I've got another one, then we'll go into that at the end of the video. But for the people who actually want to know the answer to the question, here's what we're going to do. We're going to be using, or I have used on the old one so far, uh, Firestrike, not the whole test, the from VR Mark, no, from 3D Mark. So Firestrike, I've been using the physical test on there, which gives us something which is more CPU based. But I've also done the combined test. We're doing three runs on every test, by the way, just to keep you up on that. Also, you run the combined test to see if it has any difference on how the GPU gets used with the CPU and wondering if that changes. But the GPU will be the same, it's uh, 1070 on water, so, so that should cover that. So we're going to be doing the Fire Strike 1, we're also using the, the Skydiver test, we're also doing the same stress test on the physical stress test and the combined test to see if there's any differences there. We're also using a P CPU benchmark or user benchmark has a CPU user benchmark download that you can use to test your whole system, but I'm just using the CPU benchmark results from there, just, in, just going to see what they come up with. They have a single core, a quad core and a multi core test on there, so we'll see what it turns out. You should have results popping up or have been popping up for all of them uh, as we go. I'm also going to be seeing if VR Mark, I haven't actually used VR Mark yet, but I downloaded it or bought it quite a while back. I'm going to see if VR Mark has a CPU stress testing piece of software on there just to see if we got another point of data which we can compare. So we'll go on with the change now to the to the new one. Or to well from the old one to the new one, and we'll see if there's any differences in them at all. I'm not expecting a difference, but I'd like to find out considering we have this opportunity. So just to cover something that may seem quite obvious, I'm not going to be seeing which one of these chips can overclock to a higher frequency. Although the ability to overclock may change over time, the overclockable limits for each CPU could all be down to the silicone lottery, and there's too many variables in that region to get a result that I can say would even be semi-accurate. So we're going to do a quick CPU swap with a physical comparison between the old and new CPUs. This might be helpful for you if you come across a good deal on a potentially new CPU and want to know what to look out for. As usual, we're testing with the Cooler Master Hyper 212 Evo, and during all tests there were no thermal issues. I didn't see any thermals go higher than 70 degrees, and the CPU sat at 4GHz throughout. So removing the Hyper 212 Evo, let's quickly clean off the thermal paste and have a look at the two CPUs side by side. Something I found out immediately unusual was the difference in position of the text on top of the heat spreader. Check out that when they're side by side in a second. But first I wanted to point out the signs of a used CPU, so you'll be able to spot them more easily before we see the side by side shots. First off, you should be able to make out the tiny bits of thermal paste along the line of the sealant, and a really obvious sign is the dent along the wings, where the retention bracket clamps down onto the CPU. On the underside of the CPU, you probably can't quite see it, but there are small patches of wear in the centre of each of the contact pads. If you can make out any defects on the contact pads, that will be a surefire guarantee that the CPU has been used before, but I couldn't tell you how many times it would take for this kind of wear and tear to show up. So, taking a look at the two side by side, the only differences are those we spotted earlier, being the dents to the wings of the heat spreader and the slight thermal paste down the length of the sealant. But you can see here that the text on the heat spreaders are in different positions. I can only presume this is down to two different facilities manufacturing them, but let me know if you know why in the comments. And on the underside, the package of the new CPU on the left looks like a slightly darker shade of green. This could again be down to different manufacturing facilities, or maybe it has something to do with the aging of the material, but that's all speculative and doesn't really impact the performance of the system. So, after installing the new CPU, clamping the Hyper 212 EVO on top, and yes there was thermal paste applied, and reconnecting the two 2200rpm 120mm EK VADA fans, as before, we can position the system back in place and power it on. 
Just as a disclaimer, the first boot was a recognition of the CPU change, and the second boot which you can see now sends us straight into the operating system, allowing us to perform all the tests again with the new CPU. Okay, so before we go over all the results, those footage runs were recorded after the test was completed. Obviously, the screen recording would have an impact on the results, so all of the testing was performed only running the tests themselves. So, you've had a little time to visually soak in the results of the Firestrike physical and combined test results for all the runs, and they seem to be pretty consistent between the CPUs. For those who prefer seeing average results, here they are. The Skydiver test performed pretty much the same for both CPUs, with a slight variation from run to run, but you can see from the average results that there was only a 1 or 2% difference in variation between the results. The user benchmark test was an opportunity for the CPU differences to shine in a different light, but you can see here that in this test there really wasn't much difference at all. If the CPUs were going to perform noticeably differently, this test would have been likely to show that difference. There is a slight improvement on the quad-core test for the old CPU, but that is sort of counteracted by the slight improvement in the multi-core results where the new CPU had a slightly improved score. And finally, I did manage to test using VRMark. Now this is a graphics card dominant test, but there is a slight physics based aspect to these runs, so there were potential for differences to show through. But no differences were found, which was expected, but it's still interesting. So what can we take from this experiment which we can apply to our real lives? Well, if you wanted to get a budget system, secondhand system, a couple of generations back to save a little bit of money, then if you spot a, a good a used CPU sale going on that's a few generations back, maybe around the, uh, the 6700K era, the 6000 series era, maybe a couple of years back or a couple of years forward, there's not many, not, not much room forward anyway, then you can have some comfort in knowing that you're going to be not restricted by the performance. So if you wanted it for a gaming system, you can tell from the gaming style tests that we did, which were the VR Mark and the 3D Mark tests, so Firestrike, that sort of thing, that it's going to perform pretty well. And if you wanted a more workflow, uh, workstation based system, then or user system, then you can be in pretty much good comfort knowing that the CPU benchmark test was very much more or CPU specific minus any graphics testing uh, that showed that there was not much difference in there either. Now, no doubt I, I could have performed many other different tests that I'm not aware of at the moment, uh, but as for now, you can be pretty comfortable knowing with gaming it's going to be completely fine and there can be some benefit to the workflow as well uh, for a workstation that's going to be used for rendering and editing and that sort of thing. So, so that's pretty interesting to take off from a start. And this also means then that you might be able to sell, save yourself a bit of money as well in terms of motherboard generation. Now, I know it's very difficult to go for second hand with motherboards because there's so much more going on there, there's so much more to go wrong, so I couldn't recommend a second hand motherboard. But definitely if you were to buy a first hand motherboard and save a bit of money going a couple of generations back and then save some money on a second hand CPU, you'll be in good company and you'll you'll be you know you'll be pretty pretty well off so I mentioned earlier on in the video that if you wanted to know why this channel is getting a new processor, then you'll have to wait to the end of the video. Now this is the sort of near the end of the video before I wrap up, I just wanted to go over sort of what the driving factors were behind getting another i7 6700K. So this parcel here was purchased roughly around the same time as the processor, this was pretty much the driving force and you can probably understand what this actually is and I don't know why I decided to cut it in this manner but I sort of did. Okay so here we are, this is a Z270N apparently, a Z270 MITX gaming motherboard. Uh, so it is the Gigabyte Zenith. I literally can't remember what this was when I purchased it. All I know is the specs were great, it sort of had a decent colour and it's a mini ITX board and that's what I need. So this is going to be great. I needed a Z series board for 
a couple of reasons. Now, I wouldn't have gone with a Z series board if I wasn't doing thermal testing like this. I would have gone for like a B series board and be happy with that because I don't really overclock these chips. I just, or these CPUs, I just run them as stock for sort of longevity purposes, but they have higher clock speeds than the non-K series, so that's okay, that's what I want, and hyper-threading. Um, but I want the Z series because I want control. I want control over the clock speed and make sure that I can fine-tune everything in case the motherboard tries to get it away with itself and ramp the voltages up or anything like that. So that's why I've got that. That is going to be going into many mini ITX cases in the future, many mini ITX builds in the future. I've wanted to do mini ITX builds for a long time, ever since I had uh, an ATX. I wanted to move down, then I moved to the micro ATX, and I was like, oh, I really still want that. Small form factor goodness. So mini ITX is where we're going to be sitting. In between micro ATX case reviews, we've got plenty coming up in that field. So we've got the Ryzen Tech sticks here. It's the green one. For some reason, well, the reason was that it was on a great sale, so I bought that then, saved a bit of money. We've also got the Aerocool QS240, which is a budget uh, budget case, budget micro ATX case, which I think is really interesting. We also have the Cooler Master Master Case Pro 3 off to the left there. It's got a pile of stuff on it. I can't get that one out. So, so that's what we're doing uh, in terms of cooler reviews. We've still got these, which I bought ages ago. Um, luckily, coolers aren't that expensive, so they're not a huge cost. So we've got the M9. Uh, sorry if I can't remember what the names of these things are. I buy them. I store them on the side for a bit until I have to do the video and sell them. So we've got that coming up, but I'm not going to do the M9 for a while because we've got the Cryorig. Is it M7? C7? <laughs> got the Cryorig C7, and we've got this Freezer 11P, an Arctic Freezer 11P, which I'm really interested in seeing what they're like together. So I'm thinking next video, we're going to compare these two together. We're going to put them head to head. They're relatively similar sizes ish, um, but they're completely different prices. This is like 13 pounds. This is like 26 pounds or something. So this will be an interesting one. So stay tuned for that if you want to check that out. Oh, also one thing I forgot. People asked me for an update, not many people asked me for an update on this, but people asked me for an update on the situation I had when my graphics card was having issues with my system and it was causing all sorts of frame rate drops even at the Windows desktop. It was down to the PCI Express riser which was allowing me to have the card positioned sideways so you can see all the water. So I had this sent out, this is a replacement from Thermaltake, this came ages ago, uh, just gonna see if there's any differences from the previous one, or if it's just, yep, same style card, extender, PCI Express extender, so that's come, it came ages ago, I just haven't had an opportunity to be able to unbox that and say, hey guys, we have another one. So, we have another one, I think I'm gonna stick with it in this orientation until the point where I'm, you know, I'm fiddling around with it and I can just randomly throw into a different one, the system's up and running. I'm just going to save time and leave it like that. So anyway, main point with the motherboard is now that we can have this system completely running all the time and I can always flip between CPU cooler reviews and mini ITX board reviews. So, or case reviews, anything like that. So we can flip, change, switch, however we like to and not be restricted by the fact that I've got to completely dismantle the system to build it into another case so I can rebuild the system. We still need more RAM, but we're getting there and we need more hard drives and we need another SSD. So, we're getting there. It's going to take a while. <laughs> so anyway, I'll hand over to uh, Alex from the past, actually, for the outro. So that's pretty much it for the video. If you want to support the channel in any way, you could like the video to help it with YouTube searches and stuff like that. You could also share it to do the same thing and try to counteract the demonetization issues that this channel has been facing for the last three months or so. That would be fantastic. If you want to see more videos like this one, well, we don't generally cover videos like this very often, but I look to do more like this because I like the experimentation. Uh, then you can check out some of the uh, micro ATX cases that we've done in the top right hand corner, as well as CPU cooler reviews that we do as well. Uh, I like doing the experiments, so we go through the entire uh, run of what it's like, what the unboxing is like, and testing the thing to see how it performs and then compare it to everything else. Uh, that would be fantastic. If you'd also like to support the channel through Patreon, a dollar a month would be absolutely fantastic. You can check the details out here. I've probably covered up most of it with my arm or being have my arm covered up by most of it. Then that would be absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for supporting the channel, for checking out the video, and I will catch you in the next one.